Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at the Iliad, and it's time to finally finish the book with Book 24. We've had our climactic battle between Achilles and Hector, we've seen the death of Hector, we've seen the aftermath and the resolution of Patroclus's funeral, but we still need to deal with Hector's body. And that is what Book 24 is all about. Before we get into the action, though, let's look at the key characters of this book. First of all, there is Achilles, and we've seen Achilles in an intense rage over the last several books. We saw him on his killing spree on the battlefield, we saw his intense grief both before and after over the death of Patroclus, we saw the moment of the funeral in the last book. And this book gives us a moment to see Achilles finally moving on. It's not that his grief really necessarily lessens, it seems that he's just beginning to move into a new stage. And perhaps we saw some of that at the funeral. He was deeply wracked with grief, but he was also beginning to sort of accept his own death. And maybe all that giving away of prizes to all of his friends was a sort of way of accepting his own death and accepting that he would return to Patroclus in death. And we're gonna see in this book that his vengeful spirit is finally going to be tempered. And Achilles, whose rage marked the opening of the book, and whose rage created most of the major plot points throughout this book, is finally going to tone it down. And we'll see how that works in the book. The next important character is King Priam, the king of Troy, Hector's father. And he is much more the man in the throes of grief. He's right in the middle of it. And you can see that in the way that he both responds physically and also in the way that he responds to all the people around him. He rages at some of his family members for no good reason. He's very emotional and not particularly rational in this section. And it's interesting to see the two of them at different points in their grief arc. Next, we have the god Hermes, who is going to come down and be involved in this whole exchange between Priam and Achilles. And of all the gods, he tends to be a little bit more lighthearted. We saw that he didn't engage in the fighting earlier on. He also, in this book, tends to be just generally more jovial than any of the other gods. And he's sent to help Priam out in this difficult time. We also have the goddess Thetis again, who returns to comfort Achilles one more time, as she has throughout the book. Only at this point, she's urging him to move on beyond his grief. She's stopped to comfort him and help him to get what he wants multiple times. But this is time to start letting go of his grief, to start returning to life and accepting where his position is. We also need to mention Hecuba, the mother of Hector. As she walks this challenging position, she is grieving over her son, but she's also trying to keep her husband from doing anything rash in his grief. And that balance between her own grief and her need for rationality is a challenge. We also have one very touching grief scene at the end, which includes laments from Hecuba, as well as Helen, as well as Andromache, and also a brief one from Cassandra. All of these women, other than Cassandra, have played a key role in this book. And this is a chance to hear them one more time as they express their grief over the loss of Hector. Okay, let's look at the action now. We pick up where we left off, the funeral is over, the funeral games are over, and now we return to life. And as Achilles ends the funeral and goes back to his place, he still can't let go of the grief he has over Patroclus. He can't just go on at the drop of a hat. And so as he lays in his tent at night, he's still tossing and turning and grieving. And every time the grief gets too much, where he has this insomnia and he can't sleep, he gets up, saddles up his chariot, ties Hector's body to the back of it, and drives three times around the mound for Patroclus. This goes on for 12 days. And in this time, the gods are beginning to feel sorry for Hector, having his body dragged over and over and over again. And of course, as we already mentioned in the previous book, Apollo and Aphrodite and some of the others are preserving his body and keeping it from damage. But they're ready to go ahead and let Hector's body stop being desecrated and, and allow for him to reach some resolution and have a funeral as well. And so the gods begin to plot, maybe we should get Hermes to steal the body and uh, take it away so that we can just put an end to this. But Hera and Athena say no. And the book even brings up again the whole circumstance that started all of this. Paris making that choice, picking Aphrodite over us. We're never going to have any pity for Hector or any of the Trojans. And Apollo tries to plead for Hector, saying, you know, look, you know, you all pour all this love into Achilles. 
but Hector deserves some love too. Herod doesn't think so, because after all, Hector is more mortal than Achilles. Achilles is the son of a god, so, you know, he deserves a lot more respect than Hector. But Zeus finally makes the ultimate decision, and he says, okay, no, Hector does deserve our, our love as well. After all, think of all the times that he sacrificed to us, all that he was in his life. But you're right, we don't want to steal the body of Hector because that would bring dishonor on Achilles, and Achilles deserves the honor. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send Thetis down to him and tell Achilles to finally let go of his anger and ransom the body back to Troy. And I'm going to send Iris down to Priam and tell Priam to come ransom the body. That's what we're going to do. So Zeus calls Thetis up, and she comes, and she sits among the gods, and she's still looking like this mourning mother. She's still full of grief over everything that's happened. Grieving for her son who's going to die, grieving for his pain throughout his life. And they all try to be nice to her. They give her some wine and kind of comfort her a little bit. But then they send her down to Achilles and say, Tell Achilles, it, the gods want him to let go of the body. The gods want him to give the body back have some respect for the gods, and choose this path. After all, we don't want to dishonor your son by stealing the body. Come on, let's do this thing. And so Thetis goes down to speak to Achilles. And she finds him there, still grieving, still crying, still choked with sobs, as everybody else is eating breakfast. And so she sits down by his side, and she pats his head again, just like she always does. And she says, My child, how long will you eat your heart out here in tears and torment? all wiped from your mind, all thought of food and bed. It's a welcome thing to make love with a woman. You don't have long to live now. Well, I know. Already I see them looming up beside you, death and the strong force of fate. Listen to me quickly. I bring you a message sent by Zeus. He says the gods are angry with you now, and he is rising over them all in deathless wrath, that you in heartsick fury still hold Hector's body, here by the beat's ships, and will not give him back. Oh, give him back at once. Take ransom for the dead. So she pleads with him in warning against that the gods are getting annoyed with him over this. But she also tells him, I know your grief, but it's time for you to move on and try to enjoy what you can out of life while you still can, because it's not going to be much longer. You know you're going to die. You might as well try to enjoy what you have left and stop spending your time in grief and pain and moping. And, perhaps surprisingly, Achilles agrees immediately. He doesn't waffle around about this at all. He just says, okay, so be it. Whoever comes to ask for a ransom for the, for the body of Hector, I will do it, if that's what the gods want. Why does he agree so quickly? Well, it may be the first sign that he's finally letting go of his grief. Although he was racked with sobs when his mother approached, he is able to put that aside and agree with the gods on this point. However, we step away from Achilles for a little while and jump back to Troy, where we see Priam, who is in a much worse state than Achilles at this point. Twelve days since his son died, and he definitely has not let up. In fact, his clothes are all a mess, he's got a mess all over his head, he's just soiled his body and, and uh, is just racked with grief. He looks awful. And Iris comes down to him and repeats the message of Zeus, saying, Okay, you need to go, all alone, to redeem the body of your son Hector. Go to Achilles now. You'll be guided by Hermes, you'll get there, and you'll get your son's body back. And he responds to this with surprise, but since she's a god, he immediately takes her word to heart. And he jumps up and he begins to get ready. He runs and starts grabbing all of his treasure, anything he can use to ransom the body back. And as he does this, Hecuba comes up to him, and he has this little conversation, which sometimes you have among couples, but it particularly sort of underscores his um, irrationality at this moment. He's like, honey, do you think I should do this? Do you think I should ransom back the body of Hector, go alone into the enemy camp, since I'm the king and all? And Hecuba's like, no, not a chance. If you go in there, Achilles will probably just kill you. There's no way you should do that. You're the king. You can't just waltz in there by yourself. And then Priam's like, no, I'm going to go. And so he, you know, he asks her opinion, and then he immediately discounts her opinion, throws it out. I saw a goddess. She promised me. I'm going to do it. So then he grabs all of his stuff and starts loading his cart. And when all the Trojans gather around him, wondering what in the world is going on with their king, he starts yelling at them and, and just ranting at them and telling them to get lost. They don't understand his grief. He's grieving over his son. 
And he starts whacking them all with his stick and chasing them all away. And then his, all of his sons come before him, all nine of his remaining sons. And as they stand before him, he starts shouting at them and saying, Y'all are a bunch of worthless losers! Get to your work, my vicious sons, my humiliations. If only you'd all been killed at the fast ships instead of my dear Hector. But I, dear God, my life so cursed by fate, I fathered hero sons in the wide realm of Troy. And now, not a single one is left, I tell you. Menstor the indestructible, Trollus passionate horseman, and Hector a god among men. No son of a mortal man, he seemed a deathless god's. But Ares killed them all, and all he left me here are these, these disgraces, liars, dancers, heroes only at beating the dancing rings. You plunder your own people for lambs and kids. Why don't you get my wagon ready, now at once? Pack all these things aboard. We must be on our way. And so he just lets loose on all of his remaining children, as though they were all worthless. Now, we've seen them fight throughout this story. We have Diphobus there, I mean, who really, you know, poured his heart out in battle against Idomeneus. We see Paris, and yeah, Paris has his worthless moments, but he's fought sometimes too. And all these other guys, they don't deserve this, but Priam, in his grief, is pretty irrational, and his... His grief has consumed him so much that all he cares about is the one son he lost. He also mentioned a few other sons that died previously. But he's just berating his own family. He yells at his wife, he yells at his people, he yells at his kids. And so they like meekly help him load his wagon and he and his herald set out alone because he's supposed to do this alone. But just as he sets out, Hecuba runs up one more time. And we've seen her throughout the book. She's always this uh, maternal, very nurturing kind of character. She just got yelled at by her husband and she just got kind of ill-treated a moment ago, and yet she comes to her husband again and says, please, pour out a cup of wine for Zeus so that, you know, he may give you success in this venture. And so Priam kind of settles down for a moment. He's like, yeah, 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 that's a good idea. And so he washes his hands and he takes the wine and he pours it out before Zeus and he prays, Zeus, if you really want, you know, if you really mean this, if you're going to get me safely across this plane and get me safely to, to get the body of my son back, Please show it with an omen. Send an eagle over my right shoulder, which is the traditional omen of success and victory and good luck. And so just as he does that, Zeus is like, all right. And so he sends an eagle over his right shoulder and, oh, it, it makes everybody feel a little bit better. But even so, as Priam heads out of the city onto the plain in the night, all of the people are really distressed. This is their king. And yeah, he seems a little crazy at the moment with grief, but he's also heading out to what looks like his death. He's about to throw himself away into the enemy army, and none of them feel very good about this. And so Priam and his trusty herald are, are riding across the field, and, and it's dark and it's spooky, and you, they don't know who's going to jump out at them at any time, whether the Greeks are going to suddenly surround them and kill them. When they run into this young man who looks very handsome and very young, and it turns out that this is Hermes in disguise. And rather than revealing himself at first, he pretends to be an aide to Achilles, one of the, the Greeks. And he sort of does this friendly banter back and forth with Priam. And, but he, he honors Priam and he says, I'll lead you into the camp and, uh, and I'll show you the way. And when Priam asks about the body of Hector, he, he helps to resolve his mind on that and says, well, the body's still been preserved. The gods are taking care of it. They care about him. And so Hermes leads Priam through the, the camp. And of course, Hermes is a god, so he's able to like, ding, ding, knock out the guards and make them all fall asleep. And he just flips the, the, the giant bar across the gates that takes three men to lift. He's just able to knock it out really quickly. And so they're able to get into the camp. And at this point, Hermes reveals himself and tells Priam who he is and sends Priam in to sit with Achilles. And so Priam leads the old herald Adeus out there and he goes into the tent of Achilles. And of course, this is kind of a shock to Achilles, but what's even more shocking is that the very first thing Priam does as he enters Achilles' tent is he kneels before Achilles, grabs his knees and kisses his hands. And of course, this is the posture of uh, a suppliant. This is a posture of someone who is begging and pleading. And of course, he's begging for the body of his son. But what's shocking is that he's kissing the hands of the man who slaughtered so many of his sons. And everyone is really taken aback and shocked by this. And Priam pleads with Achilles, reminding him of his own family, particularly of his father. Here's his speech. 
Remember your own father, great godlike Achilles, as old as I am, past the threshold of deadly old age. No doubt the countrymen round about him plague him now, with no one there to defend him, beat away disaster. No one, but at least he hears you're still alive, and his old heart rejoices, hopes rising day by day to see his beloved son come sailing home from Troy. But I, dear God, my life so cursed by faith, I fathered hero sons in the wide realm of Troy, and now not a single one is left, I tell you. Fifty sons I had when the sons of Achaia came, nineteen born to me from a single mother's womb, and the rest by other women in the palace. Many, most of them violent Ares, cut the knees from under. But one, one was left to me to guard my walls, my people, the one you killed the other day, defending his fatherland, my Hector. It's all for him I've come to the ships now to win him back from you. I bring a priceless ransom. Revere the gods, Achilles. Pity me in my own right. Remember your own father. I deserve more pity. I have endured what no one on earth has ever done before. I put to my lips the hands of the man who killed my son. And so he shows how willing he is to abase himself, to lower himself, to kiss the hands of his son's killer. And he pleads with Achilles, reminding Achilles of his own father. And Achilles, in this moment, begins to think of his father, and he thinks of old Peleus, because this man looks like his old father. He thinks of the grief of fathers who have lost their sons. And he also thinks of his own grief over Patroclus, and he sees that reflected or mirrored in Priam. Priam wept freely for man-killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet, as Achilles wept himself now for his father, now for Patroclus once again, and their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. Then, when brilliant Achilles had had his fill of tears and a longing for it had left his mind and body, he rose from his seat, raised the old man by the hand, and filled with pity now for his gray head and gray beard, he spoke out winging words, flying straight to the heart. Poor man, how much you've borne, pain to break the spirit. What daring brought you down to the ships all alone to face the glance of the man who killed your sons, so many fine, brave boys? You have a heart of iron. Come, please, sit down on this chair here. Let us put our griefs to rest in our own hearts. Rake them up no more, raw as we are with mourning. What goods to be won from tears that chill the spirit? So the immortals spun our lives that we, we wretched men, live on to bear such torments, the god lives free of sorrows. There are two great jars that stand on the floor of Zeus's halls and hold his gifts, our miseries one, the other blessings. When Zeus, who loves the lightning, mixes gifts for men, now he meets with misfortune, now good times in turn. When Zeus dispenses gifts from the jar of sorrows only, he makes a man an outcast. Brutal, ravenous hunger drives him down from the face of the shining earth, stalking far and wide, cursed by gods and men. So with my father Peleus, what glittering gifts the gods rained down from the day that he was born. He excelled all men in wealth and pride of place. He lorded the Myrmidons, and mortal that he was, they gave the man an immortal goddess for a wife. Yes, but even on him the father piled hardships. No powerful race of princes born in his royal halls, only a single son he fathered, doomed at birth, cut off in the springs of life. And I... I give the man no care as he grows old, since I sit in Troy, far from my fatherland, a grief to you, a grief to all your children, and to you, old man. We hear you prospered once, as far as Lesbos, Mekar's kingdoms, bounds to seaward, Phrygia, east and upland, and Hellespont, vast and north, that entire realm, they say, you lorded over once. You excelled all men, old king, in sons and wealth. But then the gods of heaven brought this agony on you, ceaseless battles round your walls, your armies slaughtered. You must bear up now, enough of endless tears, the pain that breaks the spirit. Grief for your son will do no good at all. You will never bring him back to life. Soon you will suffer something worse. And we see several things in this speech from Achilles in return to Priam. Priam's pleading brings him back to his own griefs, and they both cry together for a while in empathy. Both of them with their own separate griefs, but also recognizing the, the mirror of those griefs in each other. 
But then, in Achilles' speech, he advises them to put aside their griefs. Achilles is ready to let go of his griefs. He cries himself out. And he's moving into acceptance. He sees that the gods give both blessings and sorrows. And every life is m a mixture of those two things. Some a little heavy on the sorrows, but sometimes you get a blend of good things too. And he thinks about his own father, who had all of these blessings at first, but now is suffering because his only son is going to die. And he recognizes the sorrow of Priam and, and feels a sympathy for him even though he's much the cause of the sorrow. And so he advises Priam to move past those deep, intense sorrows that Priam is trapped in. And we see Achilles beginning to do just that. Priam is not quite ready, though. He wants to see his son's body immediately, which irritates Achilles. And Achilles recognizes that's a really bad idea. He doesn't know how Priam will react to seeing his son. And he also doesn't want to stir up the whole Greek camp, because that will lead to trouble. As long as Priam is only seen in his tent, things will probably be okay. But if anyone else finds out about Priam's presence, it's going to be a mess. So instead, he insists that Priam have a feast with him and then stay the night here. Meanwhile, he sends to have Hector's body cleaned up and prepared for the journey. And he also tells the story of Niobe. Niobe is another mythological figure who is known for grieving over her children. Her children were all slaughtered by the gods because of her pride and arrogance. And she was turned to stone and was unable to cry out over their deaths, and all she could do was weep. And again, it seems like Achilles is perhaps warning Priam of the danger of being trapped in grief. And so Achilles gives Priam a feast, and he makes a bed for him. He makes it outside so that he, if one of the Greeks comes by, they won't you know, stumble over him while coming to visit Achilles. And then they also negotiate a brief respite, a peace, for 12 days. 11 days for the mourning and funeral of Hector, and then the 12th day they can return to fighting. And Achilles clasps Priam by the wrist as he is saying goodnight to him to ease his fear. And so there's this moment of, of peace between the two of them. And at that point, Achilles heads off to bed. And he doesn't just head off to bed, he heads off to bed with Briseis, who we saw all the way from the beginning. She's the girl that was stolen from him by Agamemnon. I think it's significant that he heads off to bed with her for several reasons, and I'll talk about those at the end. But Priam settles down into bed, but he doesn't sleep for very long before Hermes, who is concerned that he's going to be caught, comes back and wakes up Priam and says, you gotta get out of here. Let's get out before anybody wakes up. And so they quietly slip out of the camp with the body of Hector, and as they come back into the city, the first person to see them is Cassandra. Now, we haven't talked about her much in the Iliad, but she is an important character in the Trojan War. She's the daughter of Priam and known for her prophecies, but nobody listens to her. But she's the first one to see him, and she cries out and wakes everyone up with her crying, recognizing that their hero, Hector, has returned, but he's no longer the protector of the city. And then we get grief speeches by several important ladies. First is Andromache. She finally sees her husband's body again. She thought it was lost forever. And she is deep in grief, knowing that the death of Hector means the destruction of the city. It means her own destruction. It means the death of her son. And he died far away from her arms, and it's breaking her heart. The next one is Hecuba, who again grieves over the loss of her son, the protector of the city, but she also is thankful to have his body returned to her finally. And finally is Helen, the one who started all of this. And she is deeply grieved to see Hector's death. And as we've seen her before in the book, she feels intense guilt and grief over the fact that she's the cause of all of this. She wishes she had died back at the beginning. But she grieves especially over Hector because, in spite of the fact that she was the cause of this, Hector was always kind to her. And these grief scenes are very, very touching and very emotional. And at the end, Priam tells them all about the, the reprieve in the fighting and gives them instructions to gather together materials to have the funeral pyre for Hector. And so the book ends with this big funeral for Hector and the people mourn for the next several days. But it also ends with no end to the fighting and more doom on the horizon. We know that several of these other characters are going to die eventually in the fighting. Achilles is going to die, Priam is going to die, Troy is going to be destroyed. Okay, let's talk about some of the key features of this last book. First of all, it is a resolution. It is resolving the arc of action throughout the book. 
And much like the previous scene gave us a, a bit of resolution for several of our favorite heroes, this one gives us a resolution for the major overarching action and tension between Hector and Achilles. And it also gives us a, an end to the rage of Achilles that started the book. Achilles is finally ready to let go of his anger, and even let go of his grief. And in having this moment of empathy with Priam, it allows him to be free from the grief that has racked him over the last several books. We see him accepting the grief and the, the way that the gods will throw both grief and joy into our lives. And he learns how to go on living, even though that his death is clearly looming. And I think that's pretty clear in the fact that he goes to sleep with Briseis here. She was the beginning of the book, and she's also at the end here. He's returned to the state he was in before everything fell apart in book one. And of course we see as Priam's grief mirrors Achilles, but also is intense and not ready to let go, we see the, the world in the throes of grief. Throughout this book we've examined the cost of war, the pain of war, and that's clearly evident here. And the war isn't even over. We end this book much like we started it. We started in a war that seems almost unending, and we're still in a war that seems unending. The cost is just going to keep rising. It's not over yet. And that's the end of the Iliad. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.